My name is Bernie Rietkerken. Welcome, everybody. Um, I'm the Senior Sales and Business Development Manager at Riscure. Well, Riscure is uh, known for three things. Um, we are a lab for security evaluations. Um, for those evaluations, we also develop our own test tools. Um, and we don't only use them ourselves, but we uh, also sell them externally, uh, including to our colleague laboratories. Um, and the third one is the training courses that we provide to educate the world uh, in the field of security. Um, so we are active in many industries like uh, payments, like content protection. And we've also been active uh, for a couple of years in, in IoT. Um, but still we, we regard this um, uh, security in IoT relatively in early stages. Also standardization, certification, it's still uh, very young at this point. Um, and, and our feeling is that that is uh, for a couple of reasons. One is perception and um, how relevant the security really in, in IoT domain. Um, and also the cost, I mean, cost versus benefit. Uh, you have to invest in security uh, and how much uh, value does that bring to you? Uh, now, um, certification uh, schemes, they are um, uh, yeah, preparing for that. They are helping with that. The PSA certified is a good example. Uh, they uh, address a, a couple of hurdles that you uh, need to take um, yeah, to, to improve your security and uh, not spend an awful uh, uh, amount of money on that. Um, and gradually we've seen a shift from people just um, throwing IoT devices into the market without caring anything about uh, security to um, yeah, we should do something about security to protect our brand or to protect, um, um, well, basically the, the users of the products. Um, and um, that at this point, we can say that it's basically, uh, yeah, on, on, on a lower level of security. So people are starting to be aware, but um, yeah, for some use cases, you really also need to start thinking about higher levels of security physical attacks uh, to, to devices. So PSA certified has recognized that as well. So they have uh, recently introduced uh, a next level of a security evaluation, uh, the level three. And um, yeah, um, we've, we've actually come to the point where I can congratulate and late Mike, um, who has with Silicon Labs uh, reached uh, as a global first, a level three certification for uh, the Secure Vault product. Mike, over to you. Um, how do you uh, see this? Yeah, so thanks, Bernie. Um, just a little introduction for myself. So I work for Silicon Labs. If you're not familiar with Silicon Labs, they are primarily a subnet communications company. So we, we do low power Zigbee, Z-Wave, uh, proprietary 15.4, proprietary sub gig, um, we also uh, just recently purchased a company called Red Pine, so we're now in the low power Wi-Fi business. I'm the senior product marketer uh, for IoT security, so I'm basically in charge of reading the, the security tea leaves four to five years out and making sure that our products have the right level of security in them. So yes, thank you, uh, Bernie. I'm very pleased uh, that we've gotten, we're the first to market with a PSA level uh, three certification, which adds uh, physical attack vectors to the remote attack vectors for level two that we already had for our uh, premier uh, security subsystem called Secure Vault. Um, and as you mentioned, physical attacks are something that uh, are starting to be required in the market. Uh, primarily, we see this as uh, protection against uh, stealing the secrets in the device, um, either for uh, making clone devices on the market uh, to basically steal revenue from companies or to actually put uh, clone devices into ecosystems uh, with malicious intent. Yeah, so um, that, uh, those are the main reasons that you see as uh, why it's important to go for um, higher levels of security. Uh, what do you see as the value of certification in that story? Yeah, the, the certification, quite frankly, for us at Silicon Labs, um, you know, before certifications, you really are just relying on marketing. So if you're a customer and you're trying to figure out, you know, what kind of security do I need in my product? 
uh, you, you'd be looking at a bunch of marketing pitches, which we all know that marketers can stretch the truth a bit. Um, but uh, certification basically puts meat on the bone and you, you basically go through a very rigorous third party uh, certification. So now you can, as a customer, you can look at the certifications of various products, you know, using RPSA, that's a great way to do it. And you can, you can also look at the certification levels. Like if you're only concerned about remote attacks, then PSA level two certification, uh, it really focuses on remote attack vectors. And then if you're worried about remote and physical attacks, then you want something with PSA level three certification. Uh, it's also a way for you to be able to compare other silicon products. Uh, without this assurance, again, you're just relying on, on marketing material. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We see that also as, as an evaluation lab, uh, we see different types of customers coming to us for an evaluation uh, that can be for a simple reason that they want to uh, basically market their product. So they just want to have this stamp um, that they can show to, to their customers, look how secure we are. Other customers, they really want to know how secure they are. So they come to us for an evaluation to see if we can find any way to, to break into, into their, their product. And then they can use that to further um, enhance their security, perhaps. Uh, and, and then, there of, course, of course, the role of uh, an external security lab is quite valuable because, well, you could also do internal security evaluations. But um, yeah, that would be with the knowledge that you have about your own products, whereas we as a security lab, um, we benefit from evaluations that we do in all kinds of industries and all kinds of products, and they all have similar types of, of challenges. So we can use experience built up somewhere else, also in the domain of IoT in this case. Uh, PSA Certified has been built around that whole topic with the, the contribution of um, uh, not less than four uh, evaluation labs on board as, as co-founders of the, of the program. Um, so I think that's uh, yeah, indeed valuable to, uh, to have such external evaluation and certification. And it goes even further because um, yeah, if you look at um, PSA certified as a stepping stone to perhaps um, other standardizations and other schemes, uh, that is something that's happening at this, at this moment too, right? So might you know much more about that as well? Yeah, so, so it's very interesting the certification if you think about the, the worldwide certifications, um, the U.S. has had FIPS. That's pretty much been the only security certification in the, in the U.S., and that's only been required by the U.S. government, quite frankly. So it's had a little bit of a run in the U.S., um, but not worldwide adopted. Um, in Europe, um, we're seeing CSIP as a certification scheme. This is, I call it, lightweight common criteria. Common criteria, quite frankly, has been the only worldwide assessment uh, standard, I believe, but it was primarily applied to smart cards and uh, you know, uh, secure elements, that sort of thing used in passports and credit cards, which, uh, which was good, but it was an ISO standard. It was recognized by the US and Europe. Now we're in this kind of middle ground where you know, what's gonna be the main uh, certification scheme that gets used I think ARM PSA is a, is a great scheme specifically for microcontrollers. Um, they did a good job of making sure that uh, they pulled a lot of um, microcontroller companies and basically consolidated a lot of the great ideas that uh, other companies had into one architecture. And then they did a certification scheme on it. I think what they're doing with aligning with CSIP is very important for the market because CSIP is a, a bit more general purpose, right? You can, uh, with CSIP, you can pretty much create almost any protection profile and get it CSIP uh, assurance certified uh, against that protection profile, whereas PSA uh, pretty much aligns you to the PSA architecture. So it's a little bit more flexible, but still in, intertwined. Um, I have hopes for CSIP becoming uh, adopted by ANISA, uh, which is the cybersecurity organization for Europe. And that would be great to align uh, the certification schemes. Uh, one thing I want to point out to the audience is that certification is not requirements. Um, certification is really a standardized way of assessing 
whatever you say you're putting into your products. So it is a, it is a standard way, standardized way of testing. Just one part of the puzzle. Yeah. Okay, and if we then go back to the layers of certification, I mean, we've been talking about um, uh, higher uh, uh, layers, uh, in this case, uh, PSA certified level three to also protect against uh, physical attacks. Uh, can, can you give concrete examples of why you see that, that being more and more important today? Yeah, I, I basically touched on it, it's cloning, right? I think, I think the, the interest we're getting from our customers is primarily around uh, cloning. And there's another thing that's driving the market right now. There's uh, the idea of attestation. So if you look at some of the advanced uh, standard uh, protocols that are coming out, like CHIP uh, from the Zigbee organization, they are mandating attestation. And attestation basically means that you need to be able to um, identify the product as authentic um, after it's been deployed, even 20 years down the road, you could still challenge the product and it would basically be able to assert that it's authentic. The way you do that is with a secret identity in the device. And so if you have a secret identity in the device, then you have to protect that secret identity. And if you're putting so much weight on the attestation, it now becomes a very lucrative thing and target for the hackers because now the only way to get on this attested system is to fake the identity. And so that's where we're seeing the big drive for uh, being able to protect that secure identity. And that's a physical attack because people are going to be able to intercept a lot of these devices for these ecosystems in the supply chain, get their hands on and put them in a lab and spend more time with it. And that's, that's why we see physical attack vectors uh, as coming into scope. The other one is um, loss of IP and loss of revenue, right? So even if you're not concerned about your ecosystem necessarily being... Uh, uh, infiltrated and possibly lo losing your brand image, you might have a problem with uh, what we call gray market devices or uh, fake devices on the market that are basically taking your revenue away from you, right? Uh, this, uh, we've talked to several customers that have this particular problem where, um, you know, whether it's a key fob or some other device, they are essentially, you can go to Amazon and purchase something that looks very much like your product uh, even has your brand on it, but it's not your product, right? So that's just lost revenue. And if that's a shoddy product and it doesn't meet up to your uh, quality standards, then basically it's the brand reputation that you're going to lose as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. If you have any questions from the audience, please don't hesitate to put them in, in the Q&A box. Um, yeah, what you're saying, Mike, is that um, there are uh, indeed these these uh, these cases that that um, um, physical attacks would really be beneficial for an attacker. Um, I mentioned before about cost versus benefit. I mean, some uh, would say, okay, but but a physical attack like side channel analysis or fault injection. Um, that's, that's quite costly to have the tooling for that and then to break into a system. Um, would that pay back for an attacker? Well, the answer that you just gave, uh, that's, that's, that's a yes, because, well, if they can do uh, spend a lot of money um, to, have, to make such an attack um, successful, but then they can use that to do a massive business with clone devices or to uh, cause major impact by, by having such an attack, that then still that, that huge investment would still pay off. So that's why uh, it's indeed nowadays, yeah, in, in specifically in certain use cases, it's, it's uh, definitely something to protect against. Yeah, and I would, I would add to that that um, it's not so expensive to do it anymore. Right. There are some companies out there. Uh, New AE is notorious about this. Um, they, I don't know what their game is, but um, they basically are putting out tools that can do uh, very cheap uh, side channel analysis. They have something called Chip Whisper, roughly $500 on the web. Uh, and it's taking away, doesn't take away the time, but it takes a lot of the experience and cost away from doing a side channel attack. So we're actually adding, even our mid-level security, um, we're starting to add side channel attack. Uh, vector is something we are, we're concerned about and putting in protections for that, even in our mid-level products. Um, glitch mitigation or fault injection is also becoming uh, easier to do. So that's another physical attack that's starting to become 
very cheap, uh, you know, uh, again, there's a product called Chip Shouter from that same company, about $3,300 uh, for a very sophisticated uh, glitch, um, uh, glitch attack method uh, with fault injection capabilities and things like that. I've seen it used um, and uh, it's very effective. So these kinds of things, you know, as uh, we all know, as things progress in time, the methods uh, needed, you know, new tools come out, new knowledge comes out, and, and these physical attack vectors, I think, are going to start becoming so prevalent that they're almost easier than the remote attacks, if you can get your hands on the device. Yeah. Okay, so good protection against all of that is important. The certification for that is important. And of course, it's done, that starts with the components. It starts, it, it, can, it, it travels from component to uh, the software layers on top of that that make use of that and then into the device um, so the yeah it, as a device manufacturer which we have uh, a number of on board here as well um, uh, you can make good benefit of um, certificates that are already in place for components that have already been tested on a, on a, on a good level um, I, I suppose that's also one of the reasons why you want to be on that level as well so for the devices to be uh, as secure as possible, right? Yeah, I, uh, really what I'm hoping is that the industry will recognize inheritance, right? So um, one of the big things I'm advocating in anything that I'm involved in is inheritance because I, I cut my teeth in the point of sale market and um, with PCI certification. The problem with that, it's, if you think about point of sale devices, terminals that you, you see to take your credit card information in, a, in a, uh, any retail organization, um, that's an IoT device. They were doing IoT security you know, 15 years ago, right? That's when the PCI started. Uh, it's a payment card industry. And they've done a really good job of uh, putting in some very stringent security requirements double tamper shields on uh, you know, the terminals, things like that, because it, it's protecting your credit card information. So I'm very glad they did it. Um, but I would say it's not scalable and it's not reusable. It's not inheritable. Um, when I was at NXP, I did a point of sale terminal, which is uh, not a terminal, but actually a pin pad, which is the simplest device type you can make. I uh, got the certification, but none of my customers could use that certification. They, it was a good proof point but they couldn't inherit the, the certification and do less work on their side when they got their products certified, even though I was doing a lot of the heavy lifting in, in the silicon. So I think inheritance is a, a very crucial part of the certification process, uh, working with ARM, working with uh, anybody who will listen to me, NXP on CSIP and uh, IOXT Alliance here in the United States on the idea that uh, if your certification is valid, I've already done a PSA level three, for instance, which basically shows that I can do a secure boot, secure debug, I've got glitch mitigation, I've got side channel analysis protection, all of that goodness, you should be able to inherit when you go for your certification, either at the CSIP level or, um, or at the IOXT Alliance uh, in the United States. Um, so that inheritance piece, I think is crucial for the market to, um, to work. And that's what I'm hoping. That's why I'm doing this. I was why I believe in the certification is that um, I want my customers to benefit from what I've done for them. Yeah. And we can also see the, 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 the certification schemes putting effort in that to create mappings between their scheme and what parts of certain standards or other uh, certifications um, they they uh, basically meet with um, yeah with the parts that are already evaluated within this scheme. So you mentioned IOXT as an example. If you if you have PSA certified uh, certification, then that translates into which parts of IOXT uh, you have already covered with that. So it makes it easier for a device maker to then uh, yeah reach IOXT certification after that. Right. Exactly. So we're at, we're at the 20 minute mark. Um, so we wanted to leave 10 minutes for Q and A, right? Paulina, do we have any yes. Q questions? Um, yes, so we don't have a lot of questions right now, but please everyone in the audience, this is the time for you now to start sending the questions. Uh, we do have the first question, which is how will laws and regulations affect certifications in the future? Um, 
Yeah, I, I'll take that one, uh, Bernie, if you don't mind. Um, I think the laws will make certifications uh, hard requirements, mandatory, because um, there's already the IOC, oh, I'm sorry, the IOT Cybersecurity Improvement Act of 2020, which was just passed in the uh, US. Uh, I believe the UK is about to pass some IOT laws. Uh, there's some laws in Australia. So there, there are already laws lining up, uh, nationwide laws uh, that are lining up. Uh, the IOT Cybersecurity Act, uh, Improvement Act in the US was primarily around uh, government entities, but I think it will affect uh, the market in the US. Plus we have uh, California, Oregon, and some other states uh, doing their own IOT protection acts. But these will basically say you must have reasonable security. Reasonable security will be determined by uh, bodies like NIST and Etsy in the Europe who are already working, ISO, ISO is working on, you know, kind of a baseline of security. Um, and then, so that's going to put requirements in place, but then the laws are probably going to require uh, how do you prove that you meet the requirements, right? And the proof is going to be in the certification. So I think the laws will basically dictate that you have some way of measuring, some measuring stick, some common measuring stick of do you meet the requirements and how well do you meet the requirements? And that's where certification is going to come in. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we have another question. So if I'm a device manufacturer and I don't know anything about security, how do I get started? I'm going to let Bernie start this one. Yeah, I'll take that one. Um, yes, of course, um, that's a good question because uh, there is this whole playing field of um, uh, standards and certifications and um, yeah, where to go first? Well. PSA certified is definitely a place where you can go uh, with this question. Um, so you can look up the PSA certified.org uh, website and, and contact them um, to see which steps you can take as a device manufacturer. You can, of course, also uh, talk to Riskier directly. Uh, we know how to guide you through this jungle of uh, certifications and evaluations. Um, uh, as we, we just explained, um, there are links between uh, certain certifications and international standards or other types of certifications for different markets. So uh, yeah, we can of course help to, to set the, the scene, um, to give you some, some guidance in uh, how to take your first steps. And the, the, the easiest step in uh, PSA certified is to do a self-certification or, uh, or self-evaluation. Uh, where we can then uh, evaluate that and, and that can reach to a level one certificate. Uh, but yeah, those kinds of steps you can take as, uh, uh, yeah, to begin with. Yeah, I would add um, uh, the PSA certified website actually has a whole section on build security into your products. It's kind of a tutorial for people who are unfamiliar with what to do. Um, I think this is where ARM did a really good job of uh, actually putting together Together, some base material about how to do um, you know, threat analysis, how to think about your products, how to build products. So there's a lot of good material there. So I would definitely recommend that website. Uh, thank you both. We have another question in the chat, which is, is the security level dependent on the RF technology used, one better than the other by technology, but do they have inherent vulnerabilities? Uh, could you repeat, you said RF, I think is what yes, you said. Yes, RF technology, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, basically um, protocols have security vulnerabilities. So what we're seeing in the market right now, we, we monitor all the vulnerabilities that are reported against BLE uh, and Zigbee and Z-Wave and so forth. Um, what we're finding is that uh, the easiest thing to do is go read the spec for the protocol and figure out a protocol vulnerability. So, so I think the, the standards bodies are now starting to have to, they have their own active, uh, you know, security response teams essentially that are handling uh, reports against the standard itself. So yes, um, you know, we, we at Silicon Labs, we, adhere to the standard. And then when the standard has uh, issues with it that are reported against it, we, we try to work with the standards body to change the standard, the, the, the spec to essentially 
uh, patch the hole, and then we'll patch our code, of course, uh, to take care of that problem as well. Um, I, was there another part to the question? I think there was another part. I think I missed it. Uh, yeah, like, uh, do, uh, wait, let me try to reformulate for you. So you already answered, like, it depends on RF technology, but also do they have inherited vulnerabilities or not? Inherited vulnerabilities? Yeah. yeah. And, I, and I think this, again, goes back to a lot of these standards were created before security was as big a deal as it is today for EndNote specifically, especially these subnets. So, so that's why I think you're, you know, even though these uh, uh, standards like Zigbee and BLE uh, have pretty good security, they just, you know, they were, they were thought up a long time ago, at least, you know, Zigbee was 15 years ago almost. Um, and, and certainly they've improved the security over time in the best minds, but you're still gonna find uh, problems. Um, I think what's interesting is some of the newer uh, protocol developments are actually looking at in no protection, which is the first time I've ever seen that. Really, it's always been about securing the pipe between two end nodes. But now with uh, chip is actually looking at a test station, and that's going to require some, some security at the end node, which is kind of a new thing. So I think the protocols are moving ahead and they're keeping pace with the advancements in technology. Mm, thank you, Mike. Uh, we have, I guess, it's going to be the last question because we are running out of our time. So what does security look like for consumers in the future? What do we expect? Yeah, I can give my view on that. Um, so we gradually see that uh, governments see a need for protection of, uh, of consumers. So um, creating regulation, um, First of all, in terms of requirements to uh, yeah, protect uh, consumers, um, requiring more security in devices, and then also pointing in the direction of certification um, to turn that into enforcement of those requirements, that's a next step. So we see that starting a bit, but it's not quite there yet. And to be honest, I think it will also take quite a bit of time to really come to a world where uh, through regulation and, and enforcement of that regulation, everything will be secure. I think that's 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 it's kind of a uh, utopia, uh, but um, yeah, there is definitely an effort to go into that direction. Uh, how do you see that, Mike? Yeah, I, I have my vision of the future, which um, uh, right now consumers, I believe, when they go pick up a, a consumer device off the shelf. Uh, because we've done such a good job in the past with with safety, uh, specifically, like I always use the analogy of when electricity started being rolled out in the early 1900s, um, you could go to the Sears catalog, which was kind of like the uh, web of today, Amazon of today, and you could buy a bunch of electrical devices, but they had no safety protections in them, and a lot of them burned down your house. And so uh, the government stepped in, created regulations, and now when you go to buy a consumer, like a hair uh, dryer or something like that. You're not really, at least to me as a consumer, I don't worry about it burning down my house uh, because I know the government's taking care of me. Um, I think people assume the same thing from a security perspective when they buy a consumer device. They think the government has somehow protected them against, uh, you know, people stealing their data or using their uh, uh, automated door lock to unopen their house and get into their house. I think that protection is already there. The truth is, it's not. It's kind of like the bad old days when you know the the electricity was being rolled out. You basically got devices on the the shelf today that have absolutely no protection, or may even have uh, as it's on this shelf. It may have well malware already in it, right? That you don't know about. So, so I think we're in that spot where uh, we've got to do the regulations. We've got to enforce the regulations. We've got to get to that point where consumer can at least look at a a brand or a logo on the device and know that it's secure or ultimately they don't worry about it at all, right? They know that every device they pick up on the consumer shelf is gonna have the right level of security for that type of device and it'll be right priced, right? So security has a cost. And so there's a right level of uh, security for each device. And this is where protection profiles, I think are gonna really drive the industry. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we actually ran out of time, unfortunately, but thank you all for joining us today and for asking the questions. 
And if you have any more questions for us that we didn't answer today, you didn't ask, please feel free to follow up with any of us later on. Thank you for joining us. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you.